Good evening and welcome. Ira Jackson is my name. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Drucker School of Management here at the Claremont Colleges. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our moderator this evening. Uh, Rajiv Dada uh, is an MBA graduate of the Drucker School, class of 1982? I think so. <laughs> graduated uh, at the ripe old age of 20 from Drucker and then went on to uh, lead a distinguished career that's only mid-career, uh, but has already seen Rajiv as chief financial officer of eBay, president of PayPal, president of Skype, and president of eBay Marketplace. Um, an incredibly accomplished uh, corporate executive and manager and entrepreneur, um, perhaps more importantly, and uh, what makes him so marvelous and, and unique and distinctive is that he's achieved all of this at a young age with values, with sensitivity, with caring and compassion for people, and with a graciousness which is rare uh, in any of our graduates. Uh, and I, I think he represents the best of what we call the Drucker difference. So please join me in welcoming Rajiv Dada. Rajiv has been conducting a series of conversations here at the Balsh Auditorium at Scripps College with prominent business leaders about important issues facing corporate America and the world going forward in the 21st century. Uh, this conversation began with a really lively exchange with Meg Whitman, the former CEO of eBay, now a candidate for governor, but it wasn't a political appearance, uh, talking in conversation with Rajiv about the character of the company. This uh, series of conversations is all part of what we're celebrating here at Claremont and especially at the Drucker School, the Drucker Centennial. Uh, November would have been and is the 100th anniversary of Peter Drucker's birth. And for this year, we're celebrating his life and legacy and revitalizing his mission and message, which we think is more relevant today than ever before. Our Drucker Centennial Committee is chaired by a number of luminaries, including A.G. Lafley, the chairman and CEO of Procter & Gamble, uh, Wendy Kopp, the founder of Teach for America, David Gergen, the CNN commentator and former White House advisor, Charles Handy, the founder of the London Business School, leadership guru Warren Bennis, uh, Harvard Business School professor Rosabeth Moss Cantor, and John Byrne, the executive editor of Business Week. So uh, with their help and with the participation of Rajiv and others, we'll be celebrating Peter's life and rededicating ourselves to his legacy uh, over this next year, which will culminate in a series of public activities that you'll all be most welcome to participate in in November here on campus. The subject of tonight's conversation is harnessing the power of many. How does a company reach beyond its traditional boundaries to tap into the thoughts and ideas of those on the outside of the organization? This is a topic that I think Peter Drucker would have loved to be listening in on because he believed that it was essential for executives to regularly leave their offices and get beyond the walls of their own businesses to discover what was on the outside. He wrote about this in the context of the organization mission, organization's mission and its customers. To satisfy the customer is the mission and purpose of every business. Drucker wrote in his 1973 classic, Management, which Professor Joe Masiarello has recently edited and updated. The question, what is our business, can be answered only by looking at the business from the outside in, from the point of view of a customer and the market. Drucker wrote about it in the context of the chief executive in particular to define the meaningful outside of the organization, Drucker declared in 2002, is the CEO's first task. He lamented that most of our information and accounting and valuation systems focus on the inside of the corporation and actually, he said, have done more harm than good to business management. They've 
aggravated and what all along has been management's degenerative tendency, especially in big corporations, to focus inward on costs and efforts rather than outward on opportunities, changes, and threats. He was writing that about a corporation called General Motors in 1950. They, uh, they didn't assign Peter's book at General Motors. In fact, they asked him to leave the corporation, <laughs> but Henry Ford II assigned that book as required reading to his executive team across the street. Today's, tonight's conversation is all about exploring what this frontier, looking out and in, looks like now, a decade after Drucker penned those and other words. Without further delay, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce the moderator for this evening's conversation with an, another unusual and gifted leader, Rajiv Dada. Thank you. Oops. Thank you very much, Ira, for that. And um, I wish my kids were here to listen to that introduction. <laughs> so, um, so I have the incredible privilege and honor, actually, today of um, welcoming a guest today that um, I suspect many of you use his company's product um, and, and at one time or the other. So the gentleman is Scott Cook. And Scott is, as many of you know, um, the founder of Intuit. Uh, Scott has an incredible um, uh, background in history. Uh, you know, he, he started at USC. Actually, we learned that he grew up in La Cunada, not far from here. He went to USC where he majored in mathematics and economics. Um, he then went on to Harvard Business School. He was a brand manager at P&G, and then he was at Bain before he left to start this company called Intuit, which eventually became you know, the, the owner and, and creator of TurboTax and all of the different accounting software that you use at home. Um, Scott is incredibly distinguished. Um, you know, he is on the board of the Asia Foundation, uh, he is on uh, the Dean's Advisory Council to the Harvard Business School um, you know, and, and the Center for Brand and Product Management at the University of Wisconsin. And in terms of the corporate boards, um, you know, there is rarely somebody who sort of has spanned as many boards as, as, as Scott has, uh, actually. He is, was on the board of Amazon. He is on the board of eBay. Uh, he's on the board of Procter & Gamble. And, but much more than that, um, I had the opportunity to work with Scott while he was on the eBay board for a number of years. And actually, he was one of the first two board members that this very young company called eBay recruited to the board. And Scott Cook and Howard Schultz, Howard Schultz being the founder of Starbucks. And the reason was that here were two entrepreneurs that had changed behavior amongst consumers. You know, who knew that you needed your latte? And who knew that actually there was a different way to pay your bills and to do your taxes? And until Scott and Howard came along, actually this was you know, unheard of in, in, uh, sort of in, in homes around the world. Uh, you know, Scott is truly one of the sort of top entrepreneurs in America. And, and this is an entrepreneurial story uh, that is, the more you learn about it, is, is fascinating. Uh, you know, he left into it, he left Bain, uh, where he was uh, a consultant and sort of working on a number of projects, having a very comfortable lifestyle, to actually go and you know, sort of take on a very risky proposition. There were a number of competing software companies at the time that actually had uh, uh, products for paying your bills and for taxes. And he actually said, there is a better way to do this. And there was a profound aha that is the kind of thing that Scott would have, which is he sort of for the first time, approached this from a consumer standpoint. And up until then, software was all about features. You know, today we learn about Apple, about making it simple and designing it for human use. Well, Scott did that for software more than 20 years ago. Um, you know, and, you know, he, he, and, and the interesting thing is that he, this wasn't an instant success. He iterated on this several times, and he pioneered this whole notion of actually following the customer home, right down to how do, how do they open the software, how do they open the shrink wrap, how do they actually interact with the product, and that is something that Scott did uniquely. Um, you know, this is, I, I think, one of the great American stories of entrepreneurship. Uh, but 
more than that, you know, Scott is a maniacal consumer behaviorist. I mean, all the discussions I've ever had with him on the eBay board is he is sort of very focused on, so tell me how the consumer thinks about this. Um, and, you know, he is probably, and I say this with, um, um, you know, recognition of all the wonderful people I've interacted with, the smartest person I have ever met. Um, and he is wicked, wicked smart. Uh, one of the things that I'll remember very well is that, you know, and Scott is, is, has the ability when you're talking about something to find the one logical flaw and go right to it. <laughs> and it was very uncomfortable for me as an executive in the company. And, and what he would do very often, in the nicest way possible, because he's, as you'll meet him in a second, sort of just a wonderful human being, you know, he'd, he'd actually sort of pull out his sword and he'd go, you know, sort of fillet you, and you'd sort of collapse, and you hadn't actually realized you'd collapsed. And, but he had this ability to really get to the heart of the issue. And, and it's something that, um, you know, I, I always remember fondly about Scott, which is he would make me double check my work like about 10 times. Um, Scott is a renaissance man. You know, he has passions. He knows a lot about a lot of things. And, um, and he is, he's, he's an absolute delight. You know, and he has many passions. Um, you know, and legend has it, uh, one of his passions, for those of you uh, that are from Cincinnati, is the skyline chili. Uh, Taco Bell is another one of his passions. Um, he has, you know, I, I would argue that he is probably one of the foremost people, uh, entrepreneurs in America that has gone to uh, study on Japan and, and sort of Japanese manufacturing techniques. And he spent a ton of time in, in Japan sort of really trying to understand uh, the, the whole approach. But Scott's biggest passion um, has actually been around this whole issue of how do you harness the power of many? How do you take what he describes as the contribution revolution, which is the contribution from lots of people to create innovation. And that's actually what I would love to talk to him about today. And uh, it's an honor and a privilege to welcome Scott Cook. And let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. So, Scott. Nice introduction. Uh, welcome. I, uh, I don't recognize the person. I'd like to meet him, though. <laughs> no, it, it's... it's uh, I, I heard the, the whole Skyline Chili thing. Are you, are you going to tell us about that? Um, <laughs> well, there's a, uh, an ethnic dish, uh, food sold only in Cincinnati, Ohio, in a chain of fast food restaurants where they take spaghetti and they pour chili on top of it and then onions and then cheese. They call it a four-way or a five-way and only... You, only if you've been in that area do you recognize it. I see a couple of people nodding. And <laughs> most folks who are imports, who didn't grow up there, can't stand the stuff, my wife included, but I think it's great. So <laughs> at times I'll fly in for the board meeting and then make a detour to the Skyline Chili place and on the way and to relive old times. But anyway, yeah. you had to be there. It sounds appetizing. It's good. <laughs> um, so, Scott, you know, Scott, you and I started talking about um, this whole notion of harnessing the power of many, um, you know, some time back. Uh, I think it actually it came out of, you know, your interest in network effects at some level, you know, on eBay. But what I thought would be really interesting is for you to recount your sort of journey of discovery. And it actually began with one of Drucker's books. Well, it is an illustration of... Um one of the principles that Drucker had on innovation and entrepreneurship. So he wrote what may be the best book on the subject of innovation back in the 70s, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, or early 80s. And in it, he uh, believes you can stack rank the sources of business innovation from the most fruitful and productive to the least likely to succeed. He says there's only seven sources. And his, the source on top, which he says is the most productive, fruitful source for innovative business thinking and breakthroughs, he calls the unexpected. And it's when things happen that aren't what you expected 
that that's the marketplace speaking to you, trying to teach you something you don't yet understand. Um, I would, one way to translate that is to savor surprises. If you see surprises, something's going on that may be important. So that's the, that's the principle. Now let's illustrate that. Um, it, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, Pierre did not approach me, Pierre Omidyar, who was the founder of eBay, did not approach me with his business plan. Because if he had, and I know a venture capitalist who had an early look at it and right. who turned it down, I can assure you I would have turned it down. This concept of opening a store and leaving it empty, leaving the shelves bare, and having your customers fill up the shelves, well, that can't work. I mean, retail is all about merchandising, carefully selecting the merchandise. Right, right, right. So that can't work. And then the concept that eBay embodied that you buy from somebody you've never heard of and never met and will never see again in all odds. And the transaction was consummated by, at the time, this was at the initiation of eBay and for the first four or five years, you, to pay for the transaction, the buyer would go to the uh, post office of the bank right. and get a cashier's check and mail it off to the seller, this person you have never met and will never see again. For an item you have never seen. <laughs> uh, right, and you've never seen. For merchandise you've never seen. Right. In hopes that the merchandise was presented by this total stranger accurately and in hopes that the total stranger would actually send you the goods after getting the cashier's check. I would have never believed it could work. Yet you joined the board. At, and, you, and eBay was not established at that point. You couldn't deny the data. Okay. You could not deny that it was working. I, mean, I originally discovered it because I would go through the lists of, this was 96 or 7, the beginning of the web era, and I'd go through the bestseller lists. The, they were, um, the top websites? The top websites. websites you know, right. The list of 1,000 websites. Right. And you'd look at the traffic statistics to see what trends you could see. And you'd go down, and the most interesting for me statistic was the page views per visitor. So most were very low, you know, three, four pages per visitor. The porn sites were a lot higher, you know. <laughs> um, uh, they could be, you know, 20, 30. But n other than them, nothing was over like a 10 page views per visitor. And then way down the list, and way down the list was this thing called eBay. And it was 35 page views per visitor. I said, wow, what's going on with these guys? And it's I, not listed in the porn section. So I, I, I made it. We did have an adult section, but that wasn't quite the right. right. <laughs> and, and so I made a note, I got to find out what these guys are doing. But I got busy and I didn't. And then I got a phone call from Meg Whitman, who I'd known at uh, P&G and at Bain. And she said, Scott, I've joined this little firm called eBay. and I'd like to talk to you about it. And I said, well, I don't know what you're doing, but I'd like to learn. And you couldn't deny the data. It was clearly, so that was a surprise. How could this thing that shouldn't have worked be working? So there couldn't have been many executives that were looking at the top 100 websites <laughs> in 1996. I, I mean, honestly, this was so new at that time. Yeah, but it was the future. And it was, and then, so I was on the board of, at Amazon at the same time. Um, and at, after one board meeting, or at the end of one board meeting, Jeff Bezos, the founder, described to us how he was, they already had the official reviews from critics, uh, highly paid and respected critics, for all the books. And he was going to add a new feature that would allow any user to put up their own review and write their own review. So I, I, fortunately, I, I didn't speak up in the meeting. <laughs> but afterwards, I went to Jeff and said, you know, Jeff, that's really a bad idea. That's never going to work. Because one, why would anyone who'd already read the book or watched the movie waste their time to write a review of, I mean, why would anyone do that? And then even if by some chance people wrote reviews, why would anyone actually believe the review of some Yahoo they've never met whose tastes could be entirely different? Well, fortunately, Jeff uh, ignored this fine advice I was giving him. And which shows that he's quite wise and shows what I did not understand because we can do a survey here. So how many of you use Amazon to buy things? Oh, okay. Now I'm going to give you a choice between which set of reviews you depend on more. The, 
And so you know the choice would be the official critics' reviews or those written by other users of Amazon. Okay, how many depend more on the official critics' reviews? Raise your hands. Yep. And how many depend more on the users' reviews? Yep. Me too. Mm -hmm. Now that was a surprise. Mm. But I didn't connect eBay and Amazon reviews. They were two different things. You know, One is now called user-generated content, and eBay is something else. And then there was open source. Well, that shouldn't work. Here you have some of the finest, best-managed corporations in the world building software. And at times, a gaggly co collection of random engineers and volunteers can produce stuff equally good. So why don't you describe open source? Open source uh, yeah. is, yeah. unlike what we do, where we have engineers who work for salary and code software that we ship for a price and sell it, open source defies all logic. It is this thing where engineers just start contributing code to a project for no pay, totally voluntarily. And then as a group or a single individual then decides which of that code is good, but the code is open for any engineer anywhere in the world to contribute to. And by God, this totally open volunteer thing has produced Linux, Linux, yeah. uh, Firefox. Java. How many people here use Firefox? Yeah. All written by volunteers who don't give. I mean, they have a little tiny paid staff now, mm -hmm. but it's produced a nonprofit that's embarrassingly profitable. Um, Java. Uh, Java. Uh, Java. Java is a, yeah. uh, it's a Mod hybrid. A moderated yeah. open source. Um, Apache, which is the leading web. A server is done open source. Who would have thought that a bunch of, I mean, can you imagine going into the car business with a proposition? Yeah, we're just going to have people volunteer to design it and volunteer to build it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we're going to compete against Toyota and BMW. I mean, but it works. You also described one other sort of non tech, non web sort of pattern oh, yeah. recognition, Comdex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd been uh, intrigued by the profit model of Comdex. Comdex yeah. was a big trade show. So this could apply to the uh, Consumer Electronics Show or any truly large trade show. Uh, and for a while, Comdex was the largest trade show in Las Vegas. And here's an event where a man, his name was Sheldon Adelson, rents the largest convention hall in Las Vegas. And at for... Uh, 50 cents a square foot. And then he leaves it empty. And then he asks for the paying exhibitors to spend a lot of money to come in and at their own, the exhibitors' own expense, fill up the empty hall with the exhibits, the booths. And then there are the attendees who he charges to attend. <laughs> And yet it was jammed. It was the largest show in Las Vegas. It was so big, it outgrew the convention center. And he was making so much money, he bought the Sands Hotel and then built another convention center. And then he had satellite tents filled with exhibits. I found later somebody who actually was on the inside. He eventually sold it um, and, uh, to another group. And I found from them the economics. Their profit margins, net profit margins, were. Uh, over 80%. Mm. They would rent the space for 50 cents a foot and then resell it to the exhibitors at $50 a square foot. That's a gross margin of 99%. <laughs> not even illegal drugs, not even software has margins that high. Um, and, and, and so I was intrigued even before I was aware of these right, others right. by how could something where the owner contributes almost nothing. The value is entirely contributed by the attendees. Mm. The exhibitors are there because the customers are there, and the customers are there because all the exhibitors are there. Um, Sheldon Adelson went on to, uh, he liked the Sands, he sold Comdex at a good time, and then went into the casino business and built what is the world's largest casino, I think, in Macau. Mm. and uh, leveraged it to the hilt and was like ranked in the top 10 on some billionaires list. But he was so deeply in hawk that he's at risk now of losing the whole enterprise. The whole thing. Yeah, because he can't flip his debt over it. So how the mighty might fall. But anyway, yeah. the, so it was a collection of these things. And then, mm. But I didn't put any of these together. I could see that they were all network effects. Mm -hmm. 
where, which is a powerful set of economics. Why don't you talk about network effects? Because it, it's kind of like a special case in some ways, or it's an es essential ingredient. It was the thing about Comdex you could see. Why did everyone, why was it so crowded? You could not get a hotel room in Las Vegas. Mm. There were so, uh, so many people wanted to attend. Every hotel room was sold. Uh, so people had to go out to Henderson and other way out in the sticks to find the remaining hotel rooms. Why? Well, it's this thing where the system got better because of the participation of other people. And we talked about how one half was there because of the other half. So think of a fax machine. As wonderful technology as they were in their day, if you had the world's only fax machine, how valuable would it be? useless. But once the people you wanted to connect to had fax machines, you kind of needed to have a fax machine that spoke the same language. That's a, a network effect where the value of the system is a function of the participation of others. First coined around the AT&T network, mm -hmm. and the value of a phone is a function of who you can connect with. And if you have a phone on a different standard that doesn't connect to anyone, even if the technology is awesome, it doesn't matter. So there was for a time when uh, a time when the Mac operating with the the system before Windows, of course, was DOS, and it was a feeble operating system. But for pricing and other reasons, 90, 95 percent of computer users were on DOS, and then there was the Mac, which was this beautiful technology, but it had like a five share. How come 95 percent were using this feeble operating system, and five percent using this only five? Again, it was a network effect. Most of the software was on DOS. Mm -hmm. And so Microsoft coined huge profits. Other than Comdex, it was probably the most profitable business in the world was the Microsoft operating system. So the aha over here is that network effects, sort of this whole, when you start creating participation systems where you have you know, the value of the network growing because of participation, in many ways became, the aha was this is a special case of a bigger thing. Unlike a lot of other network effects where like Microsoft did the code, here was something that was a network effect and had the economics where the cost of goods were zero. Right. So what does it cost Amazon for those user written reviews? Nothing. Right. And what did it cost Sheldon for all the exhibitors to show up? What did it cost Pierre Omidyar to merchandise his store? We had to build some software Right. Once the software was built, the community loaded it up with products. It was this amazing phenomenon. And finally, when I, we have an annual engineering meeting where we get our leading uh, software engineers, product managers together. It will be, uh, in fact, in a week in San Diego uh, this year's. And I was at one, it was six, seven years ago, and one of the engineers said, hey, Scott, have you heard about wikis? And I hadn't. When, when was this again? Nine, uh, 2003? Okay, so quite, 2003. quite some time back, actually. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't. He said, well, you should check out this thing called Wikipedia. And, uh, and he explained the concept. Well, I couldn't believe it could work. I actually like encyclopedias. In fourth grade, <laughs> I read the children's encyclopedia. Well, uh, maybe I looked at a lot of the pictures in the children's encyclopedia, one end from the other. But So I like encyclopedias. Um, I couldn't believe, you know, volunteers, any Yahoo writing. I, can, I looked at it, got home, delayed for a few weeks, and looked at it and said, this thing's amazing. And not just the volume of articles, but the quality of the writing. So I, I checked out an article that I'm sure would have had vandalism, and this was 2003, not too long after 9-11. And I thought the article on Islam would be a good test. And I know enough about Islam to kind of do, be a beginning level bullshit detector. And the article on Islam was tremendous. It was written from a neutral point of view. It was exactly what you'd want in an encyclopedia. Mm. And then it started to click. I started seeing the connective tissue between all these examples. They were all things where the essential value was added by others, not by the corporation. Mm. And the corporation merely orchestrated people who they did not pay or did not control. And the value was created by those people. And then I started to see the pattern across, and the importance, and then looking at the internet as, as Larry Lessig, who's the, kind of the, the legal scholar of the internet says, every interesting internet business today is a contribution system. 
And if you go down the top 10, go back to the bestseller lists, you know, the, the, the web listings, uh, they look at the top 10 websites. All of the new arrivals in the last 10, uh, 12 years uh, are all contribution systems. Yeah. Every one of them. So let's talk about Google, for instance. Uh, Google. Uh, eBay, and, Facebook, and, and Craigslist. Google is a contribution system because the algorithm is a function of the, the right. users. Right. It's a clever contribution system where mm -hmm. instead of the users actually having to do anything, right. it harvests their behaviors uh, by having a spider that goes out. As you know, the way the page rank system works is a piece of code written originally by Larry uh, Page goes out and sees what websites refer to other websites. And they use the that what academics would call citations to figure out which websites must be good. They're the ones that other websites point to. Right. So there's a behavior that people had where they designed their website and it referred to others. Right. And the spider goes out and harvests those behaviors and then through an algorithm uses it to predict which website you're most likely interested in mm -hmm. for a search term. But basically everyone else's work, right? It's so everyone else's right, work. Right. Nobody at Google decides what goes into the rankings. Similarly, nobody at Google decides which ads go on top. Right. It's the behavior of the community that determines which ads go on top. Mm -hmm. um, so all advertising media in history have had somebody who decided what ad to put on what page. Uh, so it's, it's not curated by an individual, it's, curated. it's curated by everyone. By an algorithm, and the algorithm reads people's behaviors. Right. Um, and then you could see things like uh, Skype, where how can Skype offer free telephone calls worldwide? Mm -hmm. International, long distance, for free. Now video, full. High eight, definition. High definition video <laughs> calls for free worldwide. Unbelievable. How could it be? Well, it, in some large part, it's because they use your computer to help set up the calls. Um, if you're a computer on a reasonably fast network, they'll take a number of those, and they become part of the network and part of the system like SETI at home, which um, tries to find extraterrestrial life by having people's PCs, because most of the time your PC isn't doing anything. Um, even when you're using it, most of the time it's not doing very much. So it has spare cycles, and they use those cycles to help find extraterrestrial life through radio signal analysis. Mm -hmm. Well, Skype uses those extra uh, cycles on your computer to help set up the calls. So Skype doesn't have to have big servers. They have very few. You'd actually be Actually, they have zero. Um, they only have one for billing. They have one for billing. <laughs> so can you imagine setting up a system that runs on your computers and all they have to worry about is, after they've written the software, is the billing. Billing, yeah. This is... It's a peer-to-peer -peer network. Right, peer-to-peer -peer yeah. is the yeah. fancy talk for it. And, mm -hmm. But these are all part of the pattern where the essential resources that make the system valuable are contributed by others. Right. And the role of the corporation changes into more of an orchestrator. Uh, and it's producing some of the fastest growing, most profitable enterprises on the planet. Actually, Skype is an interesting point you bring up because where there aren't sufficient number of users in certain countries, the, you actually get more dropped calls mm -hmm. because there's not enough in the network to actually support the system. Uh, and you get you sort of, you get peering problems. So, so coming back to sort of this whole notion of sort of contribution systems, or the word that you coined, you know, the phrase that you coined, contribution systems. So, you know, at an abstracted level, at the highest level, what are we talking about? We're talking about a system that, by definition, is enriched by the contribution of many, and then it has certain characteristics. You mentioned one, which is a cost of goods of zero or close to zero. I studied economics as an undergraduate uh, and math, and economics is all about scarcity. Right. Uh, and, and essentially at the core cost, and you start with these curves where cost mm -hmm. and price are on. This is now confounding traditional economics. Um, there, economists uh, don't deal very well with things that are volunteered. Those behaviors are supposed to be incented. And there are a set of incentives here, but they operate differently than the traditional economics. So it's standing cost on its head. I mean, it's kind of like when, uh, in physics, when you get below normal temperature ranges and you get to absolute zero or close, the laws of normal physics go out the window. Right. Things float. 
uh, electrical circuits go forever. Magnetism becomes superconductors and supermagnetic. Similarly, when, you can, when the actual raw marginal cost drops to zero or close, a lot of the laws of economics seem to go out the window. Right. Um, which is how you can have these little upstart entities um, uh, crushing large established companies. Right. Um, it's a phenomenon I don't think we fully have come to grips with or understand right. yet. And it also changes behavior, right? Sort of consumer behavior. So when you take something like Skype as an example, um, where the cost is now zero to me as a consumer, it changes the way I use the telephone. And so I remember conversations with customers that would actually place a, uh, have Skype in, as a baby monitor mm -hmm. uh, in, in one room, and they'd listen and uh, watch in another room mm -hmm. because, you know, it's free. Right. I suspect, particularly now with the high definition Skype, you'll see people just leave it on and work teams who may be separate, right. maybe physically, maybe always in view of each other. Right. And listening, I had, we do, um, I had an example with that where we do uh, idea jams mm -hmm. where we'll take a day and have er er everyone stop their normal work and um, they go in a large set of rooms and can work on any project they want, anything they want to invent, any code they want to build, any new business idea they want to pursue, and for a day they can team up with others and make that happen. It's totally informal, totally self-governed by people in the company. Uh, and then at the end, they work all day, and then there's a bake-off where they get three minutes to pitch their, I think it's now two minutes, to pitch oh their God. idea. <laughs> and then uh, folks uh, judge it. Now we're having audience judging. And then there's a smaller group in the finals, and we give prizes, and then mm -hmm. we want to move those ideas into actually become products or services mm -hmm. or ideas. I, I couldn't attend one of them. I normally attend the bake-offs and watch. Mm -hmm. I couldn't attend one. I was stuck in some hotel back east, so we stuck Skype on. Right. And I attended, and it was great. I, even during the breaks, because they would just set down the camera, yeah. I could hear the discussion at the table. Yeah, yeah. And I could, it was like being there, even though I was stuck in some hotel back in Boston. Right. Um, so, and this can be at everyone's desk, because it's not like we have video conferencing, but it's big, expensive gear from big, expensive companies in big, expensive rooms, and you got a schedule for it. No, Skype's free. It can be at every desk. Right. You, you know, you want to be connecting with an engineer in Bangalore, or it's just when... So, so one of the things is zero cost of goods. Another that you alluded to and you've certainly written about is this whole notion of the long tail and this ability, and in, you talked about it at, you know, at Wikipedia. Do um, you want to just elaborate a bit on that? The, the sort of what you described yeah. as a fractal yeah. Yeah. You know, resolution. Um, you know, back when, when I grew up and was in high school and college, there were basically, there was only enough bandwidth for three television networks. Now, LA was different. We had a few more stations, but only LA had a lot of stations, six. Um, most cities in the US, and New York might have had four or five, had three, count them three, and you got TV in three flavors. And so how much variety did you get in the three flavors? The economist hoteling says, we've got a bell curve, and you only have limited options. Everyone hugs the middle. Well, now there's hundreds of TV channels. And now with YouTube, an infinite supply. So think of a diversity of stuff you can get. And ultimately, most people are not served. Ultimately, if uh, clothing were done the way TV networks were done when I grew up, you'd have your choice of three outfits. In fact, you'd Might have- Might make life simpler. <laughs> it would. It would be. Fashion would be like in China or not. Given natural impulses, in a police state, that remains. But in natural impulses, people would want the stuff that's right for them. Right. So the natural uh, desire to have is to get the stuff for get everything over. Cement manufacturing can't handle that very well. Diversity has costs, mm. particularly the long tail. But in this sort of economics, you can have a Wikipedia with a number of articles. Larger than 10x, right? 10x. Yeah, 10x. And, uh, that's the last number I saw. And it's like a few of the articles that keep growing. Right. And the long tail served in a way that was impossible to comprehend. Well, to use another example from something you've written about, Threadless. You know, yeah. picking up the fashion. Yeah, so you have fashion designed by.
And then the last sort of, not the last, but another sort of unique uh, aspect of sort of these contributions is, is what they're doing is they're connecting people, right? Which, well, yeah, I mean, that's lived here uh, much more than the world in which I live, Facebook. Look right. At, within, so he sort uh, uh, of coded it in a week. Um, legal case going about how much prior art he brought into that, but he Oh, Pierre wrote, wrote, wrote eBay over a three-day weekend. weekend. Yeah. yeah. Pierre wrote eBay, the original auction web code, in a three-day weekend yeah. and posted it, and look what it's created. Never before in mankind could three days' work turn into something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, and look what Facebook has done to connect people, originally in colleges and now far beyond. Um, uh, unimaginable and connecting and Facebook connecting people uh, old you know alumni when you become alumni uh, uh, and then Craigslist is another that connects people for many licit and illicit activities um, uh, again in a, in a ways I don't think anyone it's interesting if you the Wall Street Journal ran uh, an article uh, ten years ago uh, where they asked noted technologists to predict the future of computer technology 10 years hence. And they had a range of predictions. Well, the Wall Street Journal went back, uh, this was in uh, six months ago, they went back to review those 10 year prior predictions. That's pretty brave, actually. It was brave of them. <laughs> and then, then they had the experts predict again what will happen in 2018. But they went back to actually, few journalists go back to actually recap their own, the accuracy of their own work. Right. Um, and there's a, there's a great story on journalists, uh, which we should get to, but let's finish this one. The, so they recapped the accuracy of the predictions. A certain set of predictions were very accurate according to this summary. Those that were extrapolations. Mm -hmm. So the experts predicted rather accurately the power of a PC today and the size of a hard drive on a conventional PC. Sort of Moore's law, right? Yeah, yeah. Moore's law. And yeah even more amazing to me, what I call Shugart's Law, that the hard drive the has hard been drive, on a right. steeper right. price performance improvement curve mm -hmm. than microprocessors. Now, this is the hard drive, a mechanical box with things rotating in it. Just amazing. But one thing the, uh, this recap said is that the most important trend of all that's happened in the last 10 years in technology was missed by every expert. And that was this power of the people, of user-generated content, it was totally missed. Not a single expert had predicted what is now driving uh, all new uh, top internet businesses and beyond. I mean, so, so this gets me to a really important question. So is this a new phenomenon that applies to web and high-tech companies? And, and, and should, how should we think about this? Um, it's not really new. The web just allows it to flower in so many more ways. So trade shows. Right, not new. Not right. new. Talk radio. OK, so tell not me about talk radio. Talk radio, you, you know, you got some guy who's the host, but the thing that makes it work is, are is the it, yeah, right. yahoos who call in. Uh, <laughs> and talk radio is a very popular, very profitable format. Right. Uh, and didn't American need, Idol? American Idol. <laughs> American Idol, absolutely. It is the most profitable, uh, it has been for a number of years, the highest rated TV uh, series. It is extremely profitable because they have so many spin-off properties. Mm -hmm. And not only the talent doesn't come through the normal Hollywood channels, it's found out there. Right. But the voting, the actual selection process is outsourced. 
So the decisions a producer would normally work uh, and hold to themselves, which is the scarcest decision, is what talent do you put on is actually decided by the populace. And it is that drama that makes the excitement of American Idol uh, work. Um, so it is, you, it is not required that you have technology to make this work. Right. What the internet has done is just enable it to work in so many more industries and, and you don't have to be a technical company. At least you don't have to be a high tech company. Uh, a, uh, Procter & Gamble has a major breakthrough in marketing. Mm. One of their challenges is they make a, a wide range of products, one of which is harder for me to discuss, it's feminine hygiene products. Um, Tampax and Always are their brands. And in that business, you want to hook them young because the habits that women get early when they're starting tend to be the habits that they, and brand choices, that they retain through life. And, but marketing to preteen girls is a very hard thing. They don't tend to watch a lot of the TV. It's a very hard, and then you don't really want to, it's a hard thing to message in your television copy as well, as you can imagine. Um, so, some folks at P&G decided to put together a website that would have experts talking about these things. So in case girls weren't comfortable asking a parent or a teacher, like the, um, they'd have some <laughs> other place to go where they could in private ask questions and see what experts mm -hmm. would say. And then one relatively young employee, he'd been at P&G just two years, said, yeah, experts are nice, but he'd observed how people answer questions on online forms and technology, where you can go onto a Dell form or Intuit form, and other users will answer your questions. He said, why don't we try that in feminine hygiene? Um, and so they, the company let them try it. And today, there's so many girls on it answering the questions from each other with lingo you can't imagine, um, uh, and that it's now become a major marketing tool for P&G with the target audience of preteen girls. And it outperforms on a cost per new customer basis. It outperforms television commercials by four to one. Wow. Wow. Um, so even in a decidedly non-high tech product right, right. and industry. And now there's increasing, one of my favorite examples is Honda. Um, which has taken GPS far. The thing about GPS is you really want to know where the traffic is. Right. Well, I don't know, you're in Los Angeles, you probably don't care where the traffic <laughs> is, it's everywhere. But you really want to know the route, the best route now, this moment, with the traffic as it is now. Well, traditional GPS can't do that. Um, and so they'll put sensors in roads, but that only does it on the major roads, and it's expensive. And it turns out that something like a third of the sensors stop working because it's a harsh environment. Honda fitted a special thing in their GPS systems in Japan, which would report back the speed and location of the vehicle. So now they have a network of sensors in their customers' vehicles, paid for by the customer, who paid for the capital goods, that reports back to Honda the speed and location, not just where the official, on the big roads where the sensors are, but on all the roads. Mm. So they know real-time traffic because of the driving of their customers, because of equipment paid for by the customers. And then they loop it back Loop it back to the customer. So yeah. you now get traffic adjusted drive times in, on your Honda vehicles in Japan. Now they've added, here in the US, that's, they don't have that system, but they have something not as sophisticated, but they added Zagat uh, guides. Oh, Zagat, by the Zagat way. Zagat is another example. Zagat right. uh, restaurant ratings um, is another pre-technology uh, example of the same thing. Now Yelp is the technology version. Mm -hmm. but um, but what did they do in Japan? Honda added customer ratings of restaurants to this system in Japan. So, oh, yet, so they actually, it's a three-way contribution system. Of capital right. goods, driver behavior, and now driver ratings. Um, so I know, Scott, that at Intuit, um, you know, you've sort of taken this insight into a really profound new way of thinking, which is the answers are not inside, the answers are outside, and how do we harness those, and you've experimented at, into it. And you know, my understanding is, early on, it wasn't always successful. You know, Zippingo was sort of yeah, yeah. one place where it didn't work. Yeah. And, and you've toyed around with it, so I'd love to hear some more about that. Um, so after the, the chronology would be after uh, 
seeing uh, Wikipedia and then having kind of the light bulb that connected these various mm. things. Um, uh, a few months later, uh, I gave a talk at our annual leadership meeting where we get all of our uh, leaders together. And I gave a little 10 minute presentation about how this is going to change the world. This would have been 2004. Wow. How this okay. is going to change the world. Uh, and I went through the examples mm. many of what we've talked about today. Um, and I said, we've got two goals, guys. One, we've got to use this in our existing businesses to make our existing businesses better. And two, we need to free our people to invent new businesses entirely based on this, like many of these examples. Mm. Um, this is such a culture change and a mental change for a company that started, in most traditional companies, controlling everything the customer saw ourselves. When we shipped a product, we knew and controlled every element of it. Mm. That uh, most of our divisions did nothing. However, one division, unbeknownst to me, I said, ooh, Huh, we could use that to solve this problem over here. Uh, and in 33 days, they built a web business called Tax Almanac. This is a division that sells tax software to tax preparers, what tax preparers use to prepare taxes. And they have questions about arcane tax laws and tax regulations and interpretations of the IRS. And this team, in 33 days, built a little website for these tax preparers to ask and answer each other's questions and to put up accumulation of expertise mm. about the arcane areas of US income tax regulation. Um, and that little uh, experiment, uh, and then they launched it. That little experiment today, uh, five years later, is uh, there are about 400,000 tax accountants in private practice in the US. And there are about you know, maybe you could round up to 500,000. This little, t last tax season, this website had 400,000 unique visitors. Really? Now, some of those are students and others, so we're right. not at, that would suggest we could be at 80% penetration. We're wow. not. But, and we don't advertise it. Uh, we give it, it's free. So that was our first experience, and that has worked. It didn't build a great business. What it has built is relationships. Yeah, but it strengthened the business. It strengthened our business. Right, it's built right. relationships with a lot of customers we didn't yet have, and now mm -hmm. we have an entree. Uh, and again, the cost of goods is there. almost zip. Um, then we tried some other experiments. There was one I was really hot on and really pushed the organization to do, mm. and it flopped. And this was? This was a pingo. It was an yeah. attempt to do a Yelp, but for anything, not just kind of restaurants and because you have all these small businesses yeah. in your database, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've got a lot of consumers. So right. I, I think it was a good idea that we badly executed. Mm. Um, what went wrong? I mean, as a lesson, as a bigger lesson over here, as to when you're trying to sort of figure out ways to incorporate yeah. information. I think it'll be less of an issue going forward, less of a problem. But I, I think what happened is the team who ran with it didn't really internalize the DNA of user contribution mm. and sparking a community, they build it more as a software project. Right. And these are the definition that are software and social systems. Systems, yeah. right. And right. the software is optional. Right. Zagat guides, right. for example. Um, there's a kind of a cool example in a total physical realm. Mark Hatch is here. He runs a business in Silicon Valley that is sets up workshops filled with tools and uh, the kind of stuff that people use to build um, new projects, new products, prototypes. And then the members of this community pay a monthly membership to use all this equipment because it's stuff you wouldn't have at home. Welding equipment, computerized lathes and uh, uh, atomized laser cutters and stuff. And the community then helps each other out. And when they have to move facilities, the community actually of paying people actually helps move everything and set it up. So there's no IT here. This is a community drawn. It's like Wikipedia, but instead of producing an encyclopedia, they're helping inventors build their projects. Hmm. Um, and so the software is really optional. These are social systems. And I think with Zapingo, we viewed it as a software project. We didn't manage, spark, and catalyze the social community. Right. If you compare to Yelp, the guy Yelp is just out there with he fanning the flame. For the first six, nine, 12 months, 
he was on his thing every day, thanking contributors, welcoming new contributors, disciplining the contributors. So if they injected a personal opinion, he'd say, well, could you do it without the personal opinion? Mm -hmm. And I think that's at the root where we... So anyway, we have other... We, we then had uh, another... So then after the Zipingo failure, we kind of went... We got quiet on it, but fortunately, as an official company, Fortunately, people inside the company, the seed had been set, right. and innovators took over. And there was a problem we have with TurboTax. It's very similar to the one on Tax Almanac. TurboTax, however, used by consumers, well, if tax pros have questions, you can imagine how many questions regular civilians have when confronted right. with the arcane U.S. tax code. As you did when you were filing your dad's taxes Absolutely. the other day. <laughs> um, so we try to answer those questions, but we're never very good answering all the questions that people could have. So this, one of our engineering leaders had a little spare time, and he said, boy, why don't we apply this community stuff to answering questions from taxpayers while they're using t TurboTax? And he said, why don't we do something no one's ever done? Actually put a community on every page of the product. So TurboTax is a product of 20,000 screens. Fortunately, most people see only a tiny number. <laughs> um, and so you've got the working screen that asks you, you know, type in box 12 of your W-2. Right. And then over on the right side, he said, why don't we put a column, which is just users talking to users about questions they have on that page mm. of the tax interview. No one had ever integrated community right into the working pages of a software product. That must have taken a little courage, right? It did. Um, it, uh, yeah, because there was a lot of critics. Because we have 300 tax experts who build the TurboTax product. And of right. course, you know what tax experts thought. Oh, there's no way any of these answers are going to be any good. You're going to have regular Joes answering right. complicated tax things. Well, what this, about the liability? The liability, what about, right, oh yeah. Right, right. A whole bunch of negative criticism. Well, right. fortunately, this guy pursued it. He was protected by the general manager who thought the idea might work. And if it worked, it could cut our costs. Mm -hmm. So the, the general manager did it for cost reduction. Interesting. And so they relegated it, however, when it was first built into a pilot test in the lowest volume product. TurboTax has a bunch of versions. There's one version, version that is 1% of our revenues, of our sales. And they stuck it in, they relegated it just to that little one, figuring if it screwed up, the problem would be contained to only 1% of our users. And it worked stunningly, better than anyone expected. Hmm. People ask questions, other people answer them. Well, answers why were do good. People answer? I, I, I have to. I mean, I supported this, and I right. was a fan. I didn't think it was going to work. Yeah. I honestly did not think that. I knew there would be questions asked. Right. But taxes are something. Okay. Most a lot of this is hobby stuff. When you do a review on Amazon, you're reviewing something mm -hmm. that, that you were really interested in. You're passionate about. Who was right? interested in taxes? <laughs> um, and people are generally rushing to get through because they want to get taxes done. Right. Who would stop and spend more time helping someone you've never, ever seen or will never see again? I didn't think it was going to work. Do, do you know why? You see it in a lot of these communities. I mean, here's my theory of why it works. People want to be special. Mm. They want others to view them as special. Validation. Validation. You, know, you and I have worked in big companies where people pay attention to what we say. Look, there's an audience. Amazing, we're here tonight. <laughs> Most people work in jobs where management doesn't listen to them. Right. Where they could be up on the stage and no one would show up. Right. And so for most people, they yearn for the acceptance, the validation, the following of others in some right. field they know something about. And there are some people, one out of a thousand, who really have become experts on taxes mm. and are proud of their knowledge mm. and want to share it. It's amazing. This but is, is very similar to the human behavior around eBay's feedback, yeah, right. you know, which is I get feedback and it makes me feel good. Uh, Amazon's, you know, they, they sort of rank their reviewers. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's very, very true. He, he yeah. is in some sense, it's a little self-serving that people want the accolades of others. In other pe ways, it's very human. It's very altruistic. So human. Yeah. And another motivation is there are some people who, as part of this, really want to help others. Yeah. They have figured something out, and they want to help others in the same situation. It's in some ways, and f they'll do it for free, for no money. It's one of the most noble motivations. And it's not some 
strange Good Samaritan thing. It happens by tens of thousands of people every day now. So what are the shadows, Scott? I mean, you know, so you talked about sort of the ability to get people to build value. What are the unintended consequences that could be negative? You know, that's a, such a, what I'd like to do, I'll give a quick answer, and then when okay. we open up to the audience, I'd love to ask for members of the audience to offer thoughts on the shadows. Because mm -hmm. I don't think I'll do as complete a job. Mm. Um, Let's make this a participation system. <laughs> um, yeah, so why do we do that right now, okay. actually? I think we'll do a better job answering that if we open it to anyone in the audience who wants to suggest a shadow, even of an obscure one. So let's get the mics out and just raise your hand if you want to offer you up. You should say, hey, here's an unintended consequence that wouldn't be great. Mm -hmm. OK, so the question is that when you think about, you know, we've spoken about the, the, the benefits and the values, zero cost of goods, no capital requirements, incredible you know, depth in, in obscure areas um, that can be created when people are contributing to the system. And helpfulness. And helpfulness. human to others. And reconnecting people. All great stuff, right? So what's not to like? Yet, never has there been some profound innovation that didn't have its unintended consequence. Mm -hmm. And what is that unintended consequence? You know, where, where can things go wrong? So let's just raise your hand uh, as each speaker winds to a close, and we'll move a mic to you.